नमस्ते एवरी वन वेलकम टू द फोर्थ एडिशन ऑफ योग ऑफ देशी कचार डायलॉग सीरीज दिस इज अ डायलॉग सीरीज दैट इज को ऑर्गेनाइज बाय रुतंभरा आश्रम एंड योगवाहिनी चेन्नई एंड दिस इज समथिंग दैट वी बिगैन ऑन द बर्थडे ऑफ श्री टी के वी देशी कचार दिस ईयर विच ऑल्सो हैपन टू बी द इंटरनेशनल डे ऑफ योग एंड वी बीन inviting senior students of sir to engage with us and share with us the experience of having learnt in this tradition and teaching in this tradition so today we have two very special guests with us uh, very senior teachers and before we begin the proceedings of today's dialogue um i would like to make a couple of logistics announcements for those of you here um during the course of the initial part of the dialogue the first half the chat will be disabled um so that we don't interrupt the speakers as they share and talk we will be having an interactive session after both the speakers complete and at which point you could share your reflections evocations and questions uh, with the speakers and the session will be for about 90 minutes and to begin today's session today's session is anchored by apurva gupta jalan she is a yoga therapist and a member of both ratambara and yogavahini communities so i invite apurva to introduce and begin the session for today apurva over to you thank you hari uh, good morning everyone let us start with some chanting so i would like to invite lalita shankar one of our speakers for today to chant and begin the session today shanno metra shambarunah shanno bhavatvaryama shanna indro bruhaspatih shanno vishnu rurukramah नमो ब्रह्मणे नमस्ते वायो वायुमेव प्रत्यक्ष ब्रह्मासी प्रत्यक्ष ब्रह्म वदिष्या वदिष्या सत्यम वदिष्या तन्मावत तद्वक्तावत थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन and as hari said welcome to today's session this is the fourth session in these dialogue series of the yoga of shri desikachar our intention of these sessions is to listen to some of the senior teachers in this tradition to hear about their journey to hear about their learning and to really <laughs> explore and connect for ourselves some of us younger teachers and practitioners in this tradition uh what the spirit of sir's teachings are and how they have carried forward to reach us um some of the important questions that we believe we should be asking ourselves um through this series are who are we as yoga teachers today what is the root of our current teaching and how has sri desikachar impacted and influenced us in making us who we are today in our lives as people and as teachers our sankalpa is to culminate these dialogue series with a large gathering where all our teachers will be in the same place and on the same platform and so that we can honor the guru parampara in 2022 this initiative is brought to us both by ritambara and yoga vahini i'd like to say a little bit about both these institutes that i'm a part of so ritambara means replete with truth This is a community of seekers and practitioners of yoga asking some important questions of themselves and of the world around us. 
What does it mean to live a dharmic and meaningful life in the world today? And how do we do that in a manner that, that embodies a sense of fullness or what we say in a rasatmic manner? Through many vrikshams that we call them or many streams of different uh, traditions, Indic traditions of yoga, vastu, shastra, itihasa puranas, swa shakti, through these vrikshams, we offer programs, we offer workshops in which we not only explore ourselves, we also invite anyone who would like to come and walk along these paths with us. Our chief mentor is Raghu Anathanarayanan and Shashikala Anand. And you can read more about Ritambara on our website. Hari will be sharing the link on the chat. So coming to Yoga Vahini, the word Vahini means to flow, to be a channel, so in its true spirit, Yoga Vahini is like a river which has held this tradition in a way that has allowed us all to come together as tributaries into a river and flow towards the ocean of yoga and the ocean of understanding ourselves. Yoga Vahini is a community founded by Saraswati Vasudevan and Sundar Ganeshan and is made up of yoga students, teachers, and therapists, trainers from all over the world involved in the study of yoga and yoga therapy, teaching one-on-one -on -one yoga therapy, and also now entering the field of some important research with respect to yoga. We have our centers in Chennai and Hyderabad and also many small groups working all over the country and all over the world. And many of the senior teachers in this tradition are actively involved in mentoring and guiding this community in their studies and practice of yoga. You can also learn more about Yoga Vahini on our website. And that is all. So now that brings us to today's session. Today we have two very special speakers, Lalita Shankar from Bangalore and Nafte, jo Nafte Johar from New Delhi. And this promises to be a very interesting dialogue and an interesting conversation today because both our speakers have been yoga students and teachers and artists in their own lives. Each of them has a really unique perspective about the deep connection between their journey with yoga, their art, and their life as a whole. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Lalita Shankar. Lalita Shankar is a sculptor by profession and lives in Bangalore, where she pursues her work in the visual arts. She came to the Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandiram in about 1981 to learn yoga, while not fully knowing what that would entail and certainly not knowing that this would lead to a lifelong study and practice. She started with private lessons with Sangeeta Prabhakar, and one day, Sir asked her to teach some children. And so then, without ever imagining that she would be teaching, she started teaching children's classes at the Mandira. It was a period of intense learning and growth for her under the direct tutelage of Sri Desikachar, during which time he also introduced her to Dr. Jay Chandran, and his work in special education. She spent many, many precious years teaching special children, teaching them yoga as well as sculpture. She feels that yoga initiated in her life by Sri Desika Chad has seeped into every aspect of her life. We are so grateful for having you with us today. Thank you for taking this time to share with us about your journey and about the spirit of the yoga that you learned with sir. Over to you. Thank you, Apurva. I'd first like to thank uh, TV, Ritambara, Saras, and Yoga Vahani for inviting me to talk about Sir, uh, Mr. Desi Kajar, whom we fondly call him. We always refer to him as Sir. Uh, like Apurva had uh, uh, talked about a little earlier about me, I had started. Uh, I don't know why I started learning yoga. I started learning yoga under uh, my private practice under Sangeeta Prabhakar. And then um, not too long after, uh, Sangeeta came and asked me if uh, I would be interested in uh, teaching children's group. And of course, I said yes. And then that's how this whole thing started. But before that, <laughs> there's one little funny little anecdote I'd like to share with you. Um, when uh, Saras had asked me to write a little bio 
uh, about, about myself as a yoga teacher, I was absolutely stumped. I got no more than two sentences. And then I desperately, I sent it out to Jyotsna and I said, what do I do? <laughs> she said, why don't you write? I think when you think back, I think it was, it, it was uh, I didn't know I was going to be a teacher. I didn't know anything. I just went to study yoga, to learn for myself, you know, to uh, practice yoga. And then this whole thing of how Sir has this way of introducing you into his fold, you know, bringing you into his fold. I started off teaching children's groups. And then um, once, once you start teaching, then I think you're part of all of Sir's teachings, um, which is, uh, you know, all the texts, the Yoga Sutra, of course, are uh, the other texts. And of course, his uh, way of teaching, and this is something that I really like to talk about. And before that, uh, this, this whole thing about, we didn't have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, fill in our names in an app, any application to become a teacher. There was no uh, Kula Gotra, there was no, uh, what do you call, um, gender, there was no age, there was no occupation. We were all there. You can you can see we, there are there are doctors, there are engineers, there are uh, performing artists, visual artists. I mean everybody. But then the whole thing was how uh, he knew he could he knew our strengths and how we worked from there. So <clears throat> and I think it 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 will uh, I, I think everybody will you know support me in saying the same thing. You know that uh, he knew how to tap everybody's potential. Then once I became, like I told you, we were, we were in it. And uh, the way he taught was, we didn't do any diploma course. Uh, the way he taught was, he just, he just called you into, the, into, the class, into his uh, consulting room and he said, okay, you teach this particular uh, student. And then he will just give you a rough plan on what, how you should do, go about it. But the way we learned was, then you finish your class and you put your, uh, your, uh, uh, you know, the sheet into a file, that file goes to Sir, and then he does the correction and he just make markings. And that's the only way we learned. Saturday morning, we all came together. And then uh, he would take up some, some cases to find out how we went about it. And then if we had any questions, we could answer him. And that's all, that's all, that's how we learned. And I think this whole, <clears throat> I was not there for the diploma course. And I think that happened because of the necessity for a certification, especially when people went out of the country to country to teach. And, and if you look back right now, when I look back, the way he taught was so, uh, what do you call it, so strong, so, so, so much there that it, it never ever got erased from our minds. And I, say, I keep saying, I don't know whether I should keep saying we or I, I should say I, I guess. I, there's nothing erased from my mind. I can, I, I still teach. I still, uh, you know, for whoever want, who wants to learn. And then he taught me a chanting. Uh, we were all taught chanting, of course, a text. Uh, uh, the way he, uh, you know, taught us to be teachers was through his correction and his guidance. And then, of course, uh, the other, the other part was teaching children um, with special children. That was also really nice. Every Saturday we used to, uh, Jyotsna Sriram and myself used to go and uh, um, teach, uh, uh, Jyotsna used to teach the mudras, uh, uh, Sriram chanting and me a little bit of, uh, you know, using clay so that it becomes very tactile and they can use every part of the body. And then of course, once a week we came back to teach each child on an individual on a one-to-one -one basis. So this, um, Everything has gone, I think when we were there, we didn't realize, uh, we, never we never ever thought about money. Uh, at the end of the month, you know, a beautiful little envelope with a check inside. And that check could be anything between 100 rupees to somewhere between 3,000. And that was it, I mean, never. And I, I think that is somewhere seeped so deeply into, into my system that even today that, you know, to charge for me is, is I find it very, very difficult. But that's that's my problem. That whether that's a problem or not, that's something something to do with me. Um, yeah, as as, as a, a children's teacher, I continue to do so. As a special children's teacher, I continue to do so. 
and whoever, because I teach out of home, um, you know, whoever comes to seek, you know, some of that therapy, I come, they, uh, I, I have them come over. Then as a sculptor, I used to do very figurative work. And then uh, it happened very organically. Then when I left the mandiram and a couple of years later, all the things that, were be, been, that had been taught to me came out in my work and it became uh, not intentionally abstract. It became very abstract. It just happened. It happened so organically. And, and I think um, I had, uh, when it comes to my work, the way I look at it, I never titled my works, but then when people came into the room, if they felt it, I was absolutely thrilled. So that was the power of, of Sir's teaching how it just got into your system and it came out. And even when it came out, I didn't have to title it. It, it reached other people also, you know, just that, that quietness of the whole thing. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm very blessed. I'm very thankful uh, that I had such a wonderful teacher who, who just gave without holding back anything. He just gave. He had the, he was, he was so perceptive. He knew exactly how to, how to get you to work the way, you know, he wanted you to work, not in terms of controlling, but how to get the best out of each one of us. So I, I, I'm actually, that's it. I'm, I'm extremely blessed and I'm very, very happy that you all were, that you all had invited me uh, to talk about it. And I, I'm much better off when I'm asked questions than when I answer questions because it seems uh, uh, my thought process works better that way. Anyway, so once again, thank you. Thank you so, so very much for having invited me. May I in ask you a question? Please. So as we were talking before the session, you also spoke about how you felt uh, this practice and what you learned from Sir had seeped into all parts of your life, like your family and your relationships, even cooking. Would, would you be able to talk <laughs> a little bit about that? That was very yeah, interesting yeah. for me, so I'm asking you. Yeah, I think it, it, it seeps into everything. I see the, the yoga text when you learn a lot, right? They're all such fantastic concepts, but then how does it, does it work in each one's life? It may work just a little bit, tiny bit. I'm very happy with that. But then it's just that the kind of relationships that you have, the how you, how you nurture relationships, how you, of course, I've told you how it works in my own, my own uh, uh, work as a sculptor. And also, you know, simple things like cooking, like uh, keeping things in. I'm not an obsessive compulsive, uh, you know, cleaning kind of person, but then you like keeping things in its place so that, you know, when you, when you want it, you get it. So I think I knowingly or unknow actually more, more than anything else, unknowingly it has seeped into your life. Like just how I said, when, how it came into my own work also. I didn't, I didn't ever know that I would be, uh, uh, there will be a reflection of his teachings in my in my sculptures, which is very very tangible, which is uh, a material like I work with bronze, which is extremely tangible. It's there, okay. Though the concepts that are there are very very extremely abstract. Whether you talk about you know whatever the concepts are, they're extremely abstract. But those abstract com concepts that when when you put it into a, a material like bronze, I find that fascinating. <laughs> I, 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 I just, you, and the other thing is you do your work and then the process of the work is very interesting. And then once the, the work is finished, I'm not, I'm not saying this just for saying it, but I'm not attached to my work. Anybody can take my work. It's, it's that's the way it is. I mean, if I've answered your question. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to, is it possible for you, I mean, to go a little further and give me, you know, when you talk about the concepts, to give me one sp specific from any text that you have done on Yoga Sutra, uh, can you, uh, you know, talk about the text versus your work? That would be kind of, uh, I mean, is that possible or is it? <laughs> no, I wouldn't be able to pinpoint it out like that. Yeah, the, the, the chakras, the ida and the pingala, the sushumna, 
all those things you can see in my work, but though it's not, it's not, it's not like, it's not there in your face. That concept that I understand and the way I bring it out and every time I bring it out, sorry, it may be the same the chakras, but then later on, you know, when I, as, as you grow as an artist also, the way you express the same concepts maybe will be a little different. My work has become extremely minimalistic now. So minimalistic that, uh, you know, I've come down to uh, life procreation, life and death, but then, you know, this whole cycle of life. And then I, I come down to bringing it down to uh, squares and uh, circles and uh, rectangles. And, and it, that it's become so geometric. And, I've, and I sometimes I'm, I've come to a place where maybe, maybe I don't need to show anything, you know, something that is, that is there, that, not, that is not so tangible that is so biodegradable that you do it, you enjoy the process, you finish it and it's gone. Does it answer your question? Kind of, yeah, thank you. No, it, it, is, it is very difficult to actually pinpoint, you know, take, like if you have to take a sutra and do it or not, it's not like that. It's an overall, overall teaching and, you know, that he's given. And, and, and uh, when he gave, he gave without, uh, without holding back anything. And then, you know, that, and every time, like I have, he's, he's asked me to do uh, Patanjali's, uh, uh, a, a, you know, a, an image of Patanjali on copper. It's a, it's a bar relief. And every time he came out of, the, of, of this consulting room and if it was, he was introducing me to the student, he would always say, on the Lalita Panna. I, would, I used to squirm, but then that was what he was. You know, he allowed me, he was there, you know, he told me to do a the portrait of Periwar. And I said, wow, I mean, that's, that's the kind of a man he was, you know, so this, it's not, it's not, I cannot narrow it down to any one particular thing. It was that, that, that broadness that was there and within that broadness, how you bring it in every now and then, and it just keeps moving back and forth. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we will have time for audience questions a little later. If so, if an, I can see her hand raised, so let's just wait for that. I was um, so actually when as you were talking about Sir, um, I wondered if you would be able to share any favorite memories you have of Sir or what you thought you connected most with about him. That that would be quite interesting to hear. Uh. This is one very interesting thing, how he supported you and how he had the confidence in you to do what you want to do, what he had asked you to do. On one, one, uh, one morning on a Saturday class, I, had, I was all of 22 perhaps, 22, 23 when I was teaching. And uh, I had this uh, student, uh, sir asked me to teach me, she had a low back pain. She was much older than me. And then uh, I started giving her class and she was not very happy. <laughs> So uh, she, uh, uh, so then on Saturday morning, he said, Enema, and the, how is that student of yours? And that's his way of asking, you know, this, he knows everything, but then he's so sweetly asked you. And he said, sir, to be very honest with you, I don't think she likes my teaching. I don't think she thinks I'm capable of, of helping her with her back pain. And everybody started to laugh. And I said, I'm, I'd be very happy if you uh, have Muku or Prabhakar or Mukundan or anybody else, some of the senior teachers where they do feel more comfortable with the student. And he says, no way. <laughs> you teach and you will teach and she will be fine. See, that's the kind of confidence that he gave in you that, you know, if he has entrusted you with something, he knows that you will deliver. Whether we know whether we will deliver or not, he knows we will. And, and that is the, that's the beauty of that, of the, of that person where he had so much of confidence in you. He had so much of confidence in his, what he was teaching us that he knew that we would never ever let him down. And I've had uh, you know, students with scoliosis, with uh, uh, very bad migraines and all of that. But then, and when they come to a young person like, you know, like 20, 20, 24, whatever it may be, it, it was fantastic. I mean, that for, it was a learning curve for us. It was 
uh, uh, you know, the way you taught. And, and if you had any problem at any point of time, you could always go to him and say, sir, and he will, he would, he would, he would tell us how to go about it. And whenever, you know, his, his, uh, when, when after he's consulted the, the things that he writes, you know, these are just the, he just gives you indications on how you should make the courses. That's it. But all his teachings were on Saturday mornings and other things where uh, he taught us about, uh, you know, difficult postures. Or well, the other thing that uh, was a very another interesting thing because I was teaching children, not the special children. And he said, you cannot teach children if you don't know what the posture is about. And for children, you can do difficult postures and to make children stay in the difficult postures, we used to give them chanting also. And they used to like, oh God, don't do this to me. And then at one time, at Jyotsna, Sri Ram and myself used to go one, uh, one morning at 11.30 in the morning. And he used to give us his difficult posture classes. Till today, I don't know. He put me up in, Shir in, in Padmasana and Sharasana. He said, you have to feel the posture. I went up. He just gave me instructions. I just followed him and I went into Padmasana and Sharasana. He told me how to come out of it. Coming out of a posture is, is more important than getting into a posture because that's where you hurt yourself. And I came out and I said, did I really do it? So that, that is the power of his teaching, you know, that you should know what you're doing. You should know when, when you teach children and when you know those children have, uh, they are doing some difficult, they are doing postures which we cannot do. You should learn at least one time experience that posture. And I, I, he's made me experience. Josna and uh, Sri Ram will vouch for that too. <laughs> that sounds so beautiful, really. Thank you for sharing those stories with us. Um, may I ask one more question? Please. You also spoke about working with special needs children for a long time, teaching them yoga and sculpture. Could you share something a little more about that? and how, what inspired you, how you went about it? There again, I think Sir knew that I was fond of children. I, was, I'm, I'm, I am very fond of children. I was very fond of children. And I still continue to be very, very extremely fond of children. And special children are very, very special. You know, the, that, that love and that affection that they give you when you go there, and, and a, a TV, and I think they had done all of the, the previous uh, work, you know, the background for all of this, the way to teach. There were a set of postures that were chosen, like about 12, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, TV. And then those were just the postures that we, we, uh, we worked with them with. And then uh, children do not understand the concept of inhalation and exhalation. So we used sound for, for sir, Chanting was sound. If, 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 if there's anybody else, it was not like a prayer. It was, it was, um, it was uh, just a sound. And we, we used certain sounds and very easy chants uh, uh, to work with them. And it was, you could see, you could see the difference. You definitely could see the difference. One is a group class. And when you go for individual lessons, of course, the teacher is always there with you because I go only once a week and then they continue teaching the child otherwise. And then later on, when I came to Bangalore and I started teaching a few groups, I mean, that was the only possibility that I had, teaching group and then individual time they couldn't give me. Uh, I mean, they said there was too much to do that. And uh, there were a lot of children from different other, uh, other religious backgrounds, like Christian or Muslim or whatever it is. And for them to say Om was very difficult. Uh, then I had to actually tell them it is not about religion. It is about just the sound. So I said, if you want to use any other sound, by all means do so. But it, this is not, this is not, see, we, we are so, we're so, you know, whenever we start any, any lesson, first thing that we do is chant. And the chant is also because of, it's almost like a speech therapy, you know? Uh, so we use, that's what we use. And so that repeatedly I used to tell them if they felt uncomfortable, please don't do it. Or I, I had to explain to them that it is just sound, no more than that. So those are the very interesting things that you, that you came across, you know, when, when, when they think yoga is, is uh, Hinduism, 
things like that. So that's that's my and I I've always loved teaching children and I yeah, whenever of course not since the COVID happened and everything came to standstill, I've not been able to but at any point of time. And then with, with my work with with uh, special children, I had I've made a big uh, quilt kind of thing. And uh, when we used to teach children in, in the yoga mandra, after the, you know, the class, we used to have these drawing lessons, Sangeeta, myself, and, and we used to tell them, what does um, uh, Adho Mukhishwasana Adho look like? They would say a tunnel. So you, you, you associate, what does Tadasana look like? It looks like a palm tree. So you say, raise your hands and you know go all the way up like as if you're touching the palm tree, like, like the leaves of a palm tree. And then Ardham, uh, Artha Uttanasana, a diving board. We had such beautiful drawings. So for me, that became a, or a vinyasa krama. So I made these little, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a quilt where I have taken uh, asanas where the children have said it is like a tunnel, it is like uh, namaskaram, it is like uh, uh, a tree, those those things I've taken and I've done so that when when you put it out over there, they do there's a there's an immediate uh, what do you call uh, association that happens. Associations are very good with with uh, special children. That sounds so amazing and fun. It also sounds like a lot of yeah, fun. Like, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And it reminds me of how I think yoga should also be fun. Not just for children, but also for adults, for all of us. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So thank you so much for your time thank and you. for sharing so and being here with us. And uh, of course, we will come back uh, towards the end with some reflections and sharings. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you all. So we have our second speaker also today, as I had said, is also an artist uh, and a yoga teacher and practitioner. That's Navte Johar. Uh, is a dance choreographer, yoga teacher, scholar, and social activist. In 1980, Navte traveled from Chandigarh to Madras to study Bharatnatyam at Kalakshetra and soon discovered yoga also at the Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandiram. His years at the Mandiram and the time spent learning with Sir enabled a beautiful and orga organic absorption of the yoga of Sri Desikachar. He holds a deep reverence and fondness for Sir and remembers him as a simple and extremely human person. Navte studied at the Mandiram for almost eight years and went on to be the founder director of Studio Abhyas at New Delhi a space devoted to dance, yoga, and activism. His practice remains inspired by the teachings and beliefs of Sri Desikachar, namely the sub methods of calibrating movement, breath, sound, attention, visualization, and the use of inquiry as a mode of meditation. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Listening to teachers like yourself is extremely valuable for us to really be touched by the beautiful spirit of Sir's teachings. So thank you so much. Thank you, Apurva. Thank you, everybody, for having invited me today to, uh, to, uh, to not just speak, but also to see so many of you. You know, I haven't seen so many of you in such a long time. So it's really such a sweet reunion, even though it's virtual. So uh, because um, being in Delhi for so many years, I feel kind of cut, cut off and haven't been to Madras or Chennai in, in a while now because of the lockdown. So, uh, so here we are today remembering our dear sir. And, um, you know, there are so many times when I feel, I almost like get, get a shudder and goosebumps both at the same time at the thought that what if I had I had not come to the KYM and had I gone to some other style of yoga. Because um, to me, A, this is a very, very fine style of yoga. And two, it suits me. It suits me just like as though it's custom made. Uh, so, uh, so it's really a privilege. And uh, um, it's such good fortune, really, to be part of the KYM family. And I'll begin by telling you a short story as to how I came about it. 
I um, I think with time I've become a great believer in chance, and I just want to you know begin with this chance meeting that I had. So I had uh, moved to uh, Madras, as it was called then, in 1982, to study at Kalakshetra. And those of you who know Madras, I uh, Kalakshetra is in Tirvanmur, and um, I didn't know the city, and I got myself a youth hostel in uh, um, Chetpet. Uh, so for, for about a week, I was traveling from Chetpet to Tirvanmur and taking the bus. And I think it was, I could be wrong, but I think it was 23A, if I remember the bus. And I was sitting in this bus, and as we were going past Alba Pet or someplace, I, this young man came and sat next to me, and we started chatting. And uh, uh, this young man was Prabhakar. So um, soon uh, he asked me what I was doing, and I said I was dancing. I was, I was, I was, I had come to Madras to study dance, and he was kind of slightly surprised. And then uh, uh, he told me that he was a, a yoga teacher, and um, that really you know, caught my my attention because before I'd come to Madras, I somewhere secretly in my mind, I had also hoped to find a yoga teacher because I thought, oh, I'm going to Madras. I'm, I'm sure there are some good yoga teachers there. So I said, yes, I'm very interested. And he says, well, then why don't you come and meet my, my teacher tomorrow? And he gave me the address um, of St. Mary's Road. And the next day I went to St. Mary's Road to meet Sir. And by Friday, I was in a class with Prabhakar. So I joined Kalashatra on a Monday and by Friday, I'm also attending the KYM. And uh, so my, uh, my training in dance and yoga started parallelly. And I keep saying to this day that it took me about 10 years to make dance my own because dance seemed so foreign and so imposed and so forced upon. I had to kind of break my body to get into dance. And I got into yoga, not just yoga, but the kind of yoga that we practice at the KYM on day one. On day one, it was my practice. It was my body. And the comfort, and in fact, it, take, it took me so long to reconcile uh, the, the two practices that I, I was doing and to, and to kind of bring dance to that level as well, where dance also now seems to be my own practice. So this was the chance meeting. And um, as I said, you know, there have been times I really get a shudder. I'm not kidding that, you know, what if I had not met Prabhaka that day and I had gone to some other yoga school and how, because I find the other schools, um, well, I, you know, I won't, I don't want to be judgmental, but I, I, I do have opinions about them. And so what is it about this school and about Sir's teaching in particular that uh, I find so remarkable? And uh, I might not be able to articulate it very very well. When I write, when I when I write about this, I can I can be much more articulate. But I'll try to try to explain. And the the thing that I think is so remarkable about this style is uh, the same thing that made this practice my own on the very first day. That I felt that this was my body, and this is my practice. So that intimacy, that that respect, that trust, um, that confidence in myself and in my body that I received. Um, is one of the things that this, this style gives me. And uh, uh, also when I look at the other styles, I find the other styles to be so like perfection oriented or achievement oriented. Like they're going from level one to level two, to level three, to level four, from you know simple asanas to difficult asanas, to acrobatic asanas, to whatnot, level series one, series two. So as though it's like, I really find them, you know, I find them, I call them like production line yoga, as though it's a production line and you're just kind of improving the product, so to speak. And uh, there is nothing of that kind in our school. We don't like uh, uh, something, in the, in the beginning I used to find a little strange was that I would look at my chart and I would look at somebody's chart who had been studying for five years and I was in my first month and I would see very similar poses and I said, my God, you know, what's the big deal? Like he's doing the same stuff that I'm doing. So what is what is there? But the thing is that now I realize that it's it's not it's not the, the speciality and the beauty of the style is that it's not about achieving outwardly, but but about um, like the goal that I feel is my goal today is subtlety. Like how do I make it even more subtle? How do I? So it's a it's a as opposed to a perfectioning or a perfectionist. Um, practice, it's a distilling practice, like making the same little movement so distilled 
that it just kind of um, becomes becomes quieter and quieter, so to speak. That's the only word I can use. That it, I mean, to me, Sir's practice, the way he teaches, is is methods to make the practice quiet and still. And uh, I would not trade this for anything today. And I feel so fortunate that I I came here and I belong here and I stayed here. So, um, so that's one thing that I, um, I'm really very grateful um, to, to Sir's teaching about. Um, I have noted a couple of points that I'd like to share. Um, when I, in, nine, in 2000, I opened my own studio in, in Delhi. And uh, before I opened it, I called Sir and I said, Sir, I'm planning on opening a, a yoga studio. And that's what uh, we called it. And uh, I'm thinking of the name Abhyas or Abhyasa. And he says, very good, very good, perfect. Go, go ahead with it. So I uh, went ahead with the name. And then um, as, as when I started teaching, you know, the phone would ring and people would say, what kind of yoga do you teach? And I would be like, at, you know, at a loss of words because I didn't quite know how to explain it. So I called him. I said, sir, people ask me what kind of yoga do I teach? So what do I tell them? So shall I say I teach Kesikachar yoga or Krishnamacharya yoga, or what do I say? He says, if you give anybody's name, count me out. I, so he says, you just say you teach yoga. So I started saying that I teach plain old yoga, actually. You know, I just kind of, to be facetious, I would say, I just teach plain old yoga. But he says, you, you, you call it just yoga, or at most, if they are insistent, say I teach Patanjali yoga. Um, so that was, uh, that was remarkable that, you know, he was... Um, he was so clear. He was so clear and so determined at not making it, at not fixing yoga, so to speak, you know, at not calling it so and so's yoga. So I think one thing that I salute him for is to have left yoga open. He, I think he's the, I'm getting goosebumps as I'm saying this. I think he's the only person who, who fought to leave yoga open. It wasn't fixed. It wasn't. Like he would say, he says, my, uh, 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 my father used to say, I make rules and I break rules. And that's the beauty of it. You know, we, it's a style in which we make rules and we break rules and we do not fix any rules. We don't have any opinions. So um, that is uh, uh, another thing that I find incredibly beautiful about this, that he fought, he literally fought. And the thing is that the man's foresight, you know, that he did not fall into, buy into any kind of a categorization. He did not categorize. His yoga, uh, the KYM yoga is not categorical in any which way because he will give you um, something for, 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 for a purpose and then he'll give you the exact, he'll give the next person the exact opposite for the same purpose. Yeah, it's just, it's just the attitude that you bring to it, the, uh, the context you bring to it. Like it was, it was such a holistic thing that, you know, you would not just see who was in front of you, but where he came from, where he was in his life, all those things to give a very simple practice. Um, um, another thing which I, um, which draws me to this day and even more so today is uh, uh, the question of God and how Sir, how Sir tackled it all his life. Um, of course, we know that he, uh, he self-admittedly, I mean, he says that he's a non-believer. So on one hand, he is self-admittedly a non-believer. And on the other hand, he defines yoga as a practice which involves body, mind, breath, and something more. And with the something moreness, you know, as when I said, he just opens this to every possibility. He, uh, and on the other hand, he's a non-believer or at least he claims to be a non-believer. So what a, like, again, I'm getting goosebumps. On one hand, he's a non-believer. He does not give it a categorical name for God. And on the other hand, he says, it is, there is something more. So he's really pointing towards that excess. And it's the engagement of this excess, which cannot be categorized, which cannot be given a name, which cannot be given a form, which cannot be given a, even a practice as such. And yet we, we kind of, we engage it, we invite it, we honor it. Um, so, uh, and to me, you know, this, I mean, to my mind, it becomes like 
uh, Sir's yoga, to my mind, is Sankhya yoga then. Because, you know, like Sankhya, which is silent of the question of God, and yet is pointing towards some excess. He is, uh, to me, he's, uh, he's like silent on God. I would not say that he's refusing or refuting the question of God, but he stays steadfastly silent on God. And it is, again, it is such a beautiful thing. It is such an um, incredible thing, especially more and more so today, given the times that we're coming into, where God is becoming such a contentious issue. Uh, and the kind of, not just God, but the type of God that we believe in. So um, to me, I really salute that man for having steadfastly not bought into the idea of God, because God is an idea. And of course, I'm sure, you know, um, Krishnamurti also had maybe a part to play in this, or maybe not, because uh, according to Krishnamurti, the idea of God or religion is violent. It is exclusive. You know, religion is inherently violent. And uh, so, sir, of course, as we know, did not buy into any sense, like he he, he wore no sign of his religiosity on his body or in the mandiram. There was not even an om in our times in the mandiram. Um, so this was, um, um, yeah, I mean, I just, I just find this uh, so incredible and such, you know, foresight to have, because had he just kind of turned it a little bit then, you know, the style would have, be, would have become something else. But it's very difficult uh, for the style to, to become um, categorical because of the choices that he made very steadfastly right in the beginning. Um, the other day when we were discussing uh, with uh, Josna Napurva and Lalita, you know, we just kind of we were we were kind of remembering things, and I suddenly remembered, you know, like because people, my students ask me that how did you become a teacher, and uh, I don't know when how I became a teacher. I really have no idea, and that's one reason I totally disagree with this whole idea of teacher trainings. Because you can't train a teacher to be, you can't just make a choice one day that, oh, I'm going to first study yoga and then become a teacher. Like it is, it makes, it's incongruent for me. And I think all of us from my generation just became teachers because suddenly we felt, um, yeah, we just felt enabled. And how did, it was, it was just this silent uh, building of uh, confidence. I think, sir, just, very like it's a it's a percolation of confidence into the body um, that that made me a teacher. Like I would I remember like I, if somebody asked me how I became a teacher, I became one way I became a teacher was that I would uh, uh, go to Prabhakar, uh, and then Prabhakar of course was referring to Sir as to what he was teaching me, and then he would give me a chart, and I would come and practice that chart. And every every time I practiced that chart, after a while I would I would like as I would be practicing, I started to kind of imagine or visualize as to why Prabhakar had given me what he had given me. And it was like I was practicing and at the same time I was seeing my body as Prabhakar saw it. So I was like literally practicing and seeing myself the way I thought my teacher was seeing. Because he just he would just make a little tweak. He would say how I was and of course he could tell if I had practiced or not. And uh, then he would make a little shift and I would like why did he shift that? And uh, so this is one way I became a teacher. And I think this is the best way to become a teacher. And another thing I want to say is that seeing became an inherent part of my practice. I am articulating these words now that seeing is an inherent practice, part of my practice, but it was the seed was sown then when I would, in my own mind's eye, see myself practicing, but see it the way Prabhakar would, I would imagine Prabhakar seeing me. So that was one. And the second, I think, way that Sir made teachers was uh, that when when uh, classes were going, uh, being uh, 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 classes were running, suddenly we see a shadow in the door. You know, like Sir would be standing in the door quietly, and he'd be just overhearing what was being taught. And from the literally, you know, and this can be so intimidating that when you have your teacher or your teacher's teacher standing in the door overhearing, eavesdropping on what is being told and how you are performing, uh, it can be very intimidating. But there was absolutely no sense of that intimidation or that he was prying on you or he was like policing or he's trying to catch you or something. But, and only the way he stood, just from the way Desikachar stood, his body language, 
because first of all that body language exuded respect she was standing there respectfully and and so alert she would be standing there very alert very respectfully just seeing what was going on and just that body language would give us confidence just and this was like a transmission of confidence it was like a shabash on your back that well done well done you cannot do wrong well done you know this encouragement which was like passed again i'm getting goosebumps like it was like a transmission of well doneness no matter what and what an incredible teacher what an incredible teacher who is generous kind uh, attentive and passing you confidence he's passing he's trans apart from the knowledge you know i see i'm i'm a dancer no i've gone through vigorous training and i think in dance what happens dance is a very mean pedagogy where they give you everything but they take their your confidence away from you just now sitting there and she would because it's like because it's and the reason being that because dance is made into such a precious thing that this is very precious you can't handle it yet and sir single handedly demystifies yoga he just demystifies he made it unprecious he made it ordinary he made it for me to to dabble with to make mistakes with to try to test to to inscribe it on my body to wear it to play with it actually and that's what makes a student and that's what makes a practice and that's what makes a teacher and to me you know um i i i mean i just see sir as somebody unparalleled um when it comes to this and the last thing is a is a kind of a personal thing that i want to share but i think it's important um uh, uh, some of you must know that you know a few years ago i fought a case and it was a 377 case and i uh, we won and when we won the case i missed sir because i knew that sir would be very happy for me that he would be very respectful he would be happy and uh, there's a there's a story i want to share that when i was uh, um, uh, once i would go from delhi i would go every every year every six months to to be at the mandiram and once um, i was um, sitting outside and he was inside with i forget the teacher's name um, a young woman whom i didn't know and she uh, she was consulting with him and they were discussing some foreign student and he says uh, uh, the teacher group you know so somebody came to call me and i went inside the room and he said sit down and he started discussing i mean he continued discussing this uh, um, this young woman um, from america i think and he says you know uh, uh, this girl this young woman she's very depressed she's traumatized and she's lesbian and she's having a very difficult time so make sure that the teacher you give her a is a woman don't give her a male teacher give her a female teacher but a very sensitive female teacher and this he made sure he said in front of me i had no business to be part of this conversation he called me inside he specially called me inside he made me sit down and he discussed this and then he says ha ah, okay parwala oh, you know uh, 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 we we'll, we'll meet later and he uh, um, so just that that in that one minute he he spelled it all and um, so But that's all i want to kind of you know i i feel so fortunate to be a student of shri tkb basic research and to be part of this family so thank you thank you so much actually you said goosebumps so many times i have goosebumps right now because i think i'm still absorbing i'm sure we are all still absorbing everything you have shared with so much passion and so much love so thank you so much really for being here with us today and for sharing from your heart thank you thank you hi guys <laughs> i see angelika appearing in yes. hi <laughs> so now we'll uh, open up the last day sorry sir yes. Yes, Berlin. Yes, I so lucky to hear this. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, Nathesh. Thank you. I just want to share for the larger group also. It's been a privilege to 
have spent some time with uh, Jyotsna, Lalita, and Navtej. And as we hold our teachers very seriously and up there, it was the most joyous gathering with full of laughter and teasing each other and pulling each other's legs in the meeting. Um, and it really, show, I think, gave me an insight into what a wonderful community and what a wonderful friendship that had formed over the years uh, amongst all the teachers. So, and I'm seeing, I, and I was reminded of that as soon as I just saw Sriram sir also coming in. And, uh, Yes. Oh, yeah. So thank you so much, uh, both of you, for being here and speaking with us. Um, we are going to now open up the space and hand over to Hari for some reflections, questions, maybe a conversation amongst all of us uh, in the whole group. So Hari, over to you. Thank you, Purva. Uh, thank you, Namtej and Lalita. It's very deeply touching and evocative uh, sharing from both of you. Um, so we are now in that part of the dialogue where uh, we are opening it up for interactive session with the audience. And amongst us, we have some of the uh, regular attendees and some new today. And we also have some of our uh, senior teachers like Raghu, Sriram, Saras, all of them are here. So please feel free to chime in if you have any reflections, uh, sharings or questions. I would like to just begin with a, a question to Lalita. Then this is regarding when I heard about who are the guests for this month, I read about one of the, some of your interviews and works and I found that uh, there are a series of on Prana and then there is a series on in search of consciousness looking within. So there's a streak of and I think in one of your interviews also you mentioned how you are inspired by the yoga that you've been practicing in the sculptures. So if you could share more about how, uh, more specifically about how it has influenced your sculptures and it would be great. I guess when you, as a creative person, all of us are in our own ways, a, uh, it seeps in so quietly and so, uh, beautifully into your work. And uh, like I told earlier, I have a huge problem uh, giving a title to my work, maybe, but I, but I had to, you know, so I would give a, a series of my works a certain name. So the, the first series, series that I was, start, when I started doing my, you know, when it was, I was influenced by yoga was this Prana series. So you're talking about you're talking about life, you're talking about that energy, that unseen energy that is always there. And, and I think I, 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 it's very difficult to put into words, you know, some things like, it's very tangible. Like I said, I use bronze as a material, which is absolutely so tangible, but to translate that, that uh, very abstract concept of that into something very tangible, uh, it just happened. It just happened, I think somewhere, within your subconscious, it is so deeply entrenched. You're so deeply entrenched with this teachings that it, it just comes out. And then, uh, and then uh, even otherwise, later on in my works, choice of material was very, very important for me from, you know, the, like if I had to talk about energy, I, I used a lot of uh, the Ida Pingla and Sushumna and my earlier works was there constantly. And it became in a drawing, it became a very, very thin line. I, I used uh, uh, colored threads. And then in my sculptures, I used uh, uh, material, a copper wire, thin copper wire. And, and copper is something that gives you energy, but at the same time, it can also, it's there and it's not there. And so when it comes to doing something so uh, with an abstract concept, I think you have to be very, uh, uh, conscious about the kind of material that you choose from some, something very solid to something very ephemeral, because this is a very ephemeral, uh, you know, thinking it is. So <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, uh, Hari, that you went through my works is something that, you know, I, I, I don't, I just say I'm a sculptor, but I really don't, uh, I'm not one of those who just, you know, shows my work all over the place and things like that. But, it's just my own my own work. Like I just do it. It's a process, and then and then there's a certain moving away from that work. Because yeah? you just use those words. How how much do you know know those words? How deep do you know these words? 
So, um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I've, uh, it, it, is, it is very difficult to uh, pinpoint it out and say, this is exactly what, what I was going on. At that moment, at that moment, what went through my mind is what came out. Then the next moment, every time, like, you know, when you, every day, when you get up for your asana practice in the morning, every day, the body is different. Every day, the breath is different. So the same concept may be there, but every time I, I put it into, into, into something more tangible, it is, it is different. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so we do have some questions coming in from the audience now. Uh, so the next question is to Namtej. This is from Vijay Lakshmi. Uh, Sir didn't go by rules. What then did he go by? And what do you think is important for a budding yoga teacher to learn from his irreverence for rules? Uh, I would not, first of all, use the word irreverence for rules. It was no irreverence, but I would say he was very fluid. With um, so, um, so I think If I can, and I'm sure the others will also kind of um, help me with this. If I can define the way Sir uh, looked at the body, you know, looked at the body in front of him, who was going to be, which was going to be instructed. He was, uh, I think the one thing that he was deeply attentive. And of course, we know I mean, we need to define what the attention is. And I'm sure I, I can't really define it, but he was, he was a deeply attentive and you would see that he was like at that point he was like a clean slate yeah he, he wasn't coming with predetermined ideas as to this is what must be done he was there to gauge he was there to sense so it was like almost uh that he was looking at you but he was kind of he was almost like hearing you more than he was looking at you he was like getting the sense of you um so it was a special kind of an attentiveness um and of course you know respect that goes without saying complete respect but uh, attentiveness and um, uh, and uh, 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 fluidity like not not having fixed ideas um, and he wasn't there to fix you you see that's that's the first idea to unfix that he, as a yoga teacher he was not there to fix you he was just there to be to see where he could take you next that's about it the next the next place that like he would say yoga is moving from point a to point b he was, I mean, he was like, he, I, I would say that he was kind of, he would work in small, small um, um, kind of progression, so to speak. So, um, so, so yeah, I would say that he was, it's attention. And of course we have to define that attention and, and, and uh, develop that attention um, by, I, don't, I, I can't define, I can't describe as to what the attention is, but I know that attention requires uh, not coming with predisposed or predetermined ideas and listening to the body more than seeing what you could see from outside. It's like intuiting. Um, yeah, that's, that, that's the best I can answer this question. But I would not say irreverent. He was not ir irreverent. He was fluid. Yeah. Thanks, Namtej. Thank you so much. Uh, for making that distinction between a reverence and fluidity and wonderful and very touching session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question is regarding dance and it's to Navtej. And um, this is regarding the statement that you uh, shared about how the dance takes away confidence. So the question is, uh, how did or in what way did yoga help you uh, touch that confidence? Who is this question from? Is it from a dancer? This is from, this is from Preeta. Uh, you were talking about dance giving you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But is Preeta a dancer? Yeah. Preeta. No, I'm not a dancer. I'm an artist. I okay. mean, I'm a painter. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. But this, this is a question that I can answer. And um, you see, I, like I said, that from day one, I realized this dance was something that was like a dance was like a, like a like a bombardment. You know, my poor body was being bombarded with these rules and these forms that were not only alien but they were fixed. That this is the norm. 
This is the correct posture. You have to somehow get into this. And if you don't get into it, you disqualify. So the, 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 I'm sorry, there's a tyranny to the form, you know, in dance, there's a tyranny to the form, at least the way dance was uh, conceived of at that point uh, in history. And uh, whereas yoga was, you know, um, literally, as I said, I felt comfortable with it. It was my, it, it became my practice from day one. So I, from day one, uh, I could sense that they were, even though I couldn't articulate it, I sensed that this is a practice that makes my body feel loved and comfortable. It's body affirmative. And that was, even though it was using my body, but my body was like shrinking into invisibility that don't look at me, look at the form. Uh, so there was this, that, that kind of a tyranny. And what made that, and it took me years, I would say it took me like at least 10 years. I, I didn't come into dance till I started making my own choreography, so to speak. But I'll tell you what, uh, what slowly started to shift. Um, and I would say, and that's the word I used earlier, that what I began to get a sense of when I was studying uh, was that yoga was about seeing more than doing. And today I openly say this. I begin my class with two things these days. A, my body is not alone. There is something else which is part and parcel of my body. That's something more that Sir talks about. This body, mind, breath, and something more. And it's part of my body. It's not part of my soul or something. It's nothing so esoteric. It's material. A, these are my two things which I have learned, which I feel I've inherited from Sir in some indirect fashion. A, my body is not alone. And two, yoga is not about doing, but it's about seeing. And I I stand by these very firmly. So when I say seeing, I see the body, but I also maybe see other things. And when it comes to dance, again, I would say apply the same thing about the dance has become about showing. You know, when we do Abhinaya, we're all showing. That this is Radha, this is Trishta. It's all about show and tell. And I find it very, very unwatchable, actually. Abhinaya is most like most often quite unwatchable because it's all about desperately trying to show or project or explain. Uh, to me, Abhinaya is I being caught by the audience. I being caught seeing that something that only I can see and you can't. And you want to see. So when I see something, the vibhava that is making me dance. So I'm not dancing, I'm being made to dance. The same way I'm not performing asana, I am um, like in Hindi we say, we may asan ko bharan kar raha hu. I'm not producing asana, I'm adapting it, I am wearing it, I am becoming it. Um, so seeing is a very, very important part of me and that is what made my dance my own when I started to see or, or allowed myself to see, it requires a lot of permission as opposed to showing and fitting the form and fitting the norm, uh, where I realized that it was my body, it was my practice, and eventually it would be my rules because it cannot be not my rules. Because if it is not, if it's my body and your rules, then it's not my practice. I'm again saying this, if it is my body and your rules, it can never become my practice. And for me to make my practice, I have to have that autonomy and that authority and, and that adhikar to make my own rules. I might fall flat on them, but at least make, make my own mistakes, make my own. And it's a, it's a, it's a confidence that comes from a teacher to a student and this Gachar gave it to us with full generosity. And I also want to say one more thing that I feel that I was actually kind of lucky because I was in India, but not in Madras. So there was a kind of, I had that safe, I had that pretty, very friendly distance that when I wanted, I would just, you know, hop onto the Tamil Nadu Express and go to meet sir. But on the other hand, I was, I had lots of time to experiment on my own. Had I been in Madras, I mean, I had the sense of sir's proximity, you know, it's a little more intimidating to have your teacher close by. Uh, but when you are far, then uh, you are, um, you know, left on your own, to your own devices, so to speak. And so that, that, that helped. I find that really helped me to kind of figure out my own way, so to speak. But knowing that, you know, sir is there, 
to answer my questions or um, to to check things out. So it was a very it was a very it was a very good equation uh, for me. So to answer your question, it's about seeing. Yeah, if I can see, it's my practice. Thank you very much. And is that why you preferred this form of yoga to an Iyengar school of? Mama, absolutely. That is why I say I sh I I get a cold like I I get a shudder. But if I if I, if I was a doing Bharatanatyam and two doing Iyengar yoga, finish. Because both are such form oriented things. I mean, both beat you into the form and they don't allow you to, to see, they don't allow you to breathe. Um, so definitely that is the reason I love this style and I respect this style and I cherish this style. And I'm so, I can't be thankful enough that I fell into perchance sitting on the 23A on that one evening into this style and I never looked back. So. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, hi, Ramu. Hi. Just, just a small thing, Navtej, both to you and Lalita. Uh, if you use the word grammar instead of rules, ah. that sir never wavered from the grammar. No, never. Yes. Would that, would that Absolutely. fit? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And by the way, 23A is correct, yeah. I'm a 23 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I still remember 23 <laughs> Yeah, it is glamour, definitely. Thank you, Namtej. Glamour is fluid, you know, and you can... Yeah, thank you. Navtej and Lalita, I have, a, I have a question, something for you to share with our younger teachers. Um, there seems to be an overpowering influence of anatomy and form mm -hmm. on asana today, more and more. And somehow people are getting more and more drawn into that. Um, and both of you spoke so beautifully about the subtlety of the practice and the prana and you know, how do you distill that subtlety in the practice? So can you share something as a suggestion or advice or whatever, some direction for the younger teachers to move in the direction of finding uh, the deeper, subtler, experience of the asana rather than getting stuck with the form and anatomy. Anything you want to go first? Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, this this whole thing about how how he worked, you know, as an as an artist, like a visual artist, everything is about observation. You know, this whole thing about observation, how you observe, observe the very subtle nuances of the body movement that is there. And, and it is not just about the body with, with the breath, how the body moves. That is what is, is, is the beauty of what Sir taught us, that it is not so, uh, you know, uh, superficial. It is something much more deeper. And I think in his own way, he taught us how to uh, observe observe the lines, observe the movement, observe the thing with, with, uh, uh, with the body movement. And I think it is, yes, it's unfortunate that people are talking about so much about just the body, but then with the breath, what does it do to the body? That, that, is, that is so important because like, like you know, earlier, every time, every morning when you get up, your breath is different. And therefore, when your breath is different, your body will act differently. And then if you're, instead of pushing yourself into say, yesterday I did a, in my, in my asanas, it was, a, my pranayama was at 8, a 8, 16 ratio. If this morning I cannot do it, it's okay. It's absolutely okay. Why are you pushing yourself? And then you got, go into some other problem. And then this whole other thing that I always tell everybody is, um, doing a posture is not as important as getting out of the posture because it is so embedded in my mind that when Sir says, only when you come, come out of a posture, that, that's where the possibility of hurting yourself is so high. If you don't know how your body is, is working, if you're not able to concentrate on what you're doing right then and there, when you hurt yourself, then you can go very easily go out and say, oh yeah, she taught me this and then I did something to my body and therefore this happened. That's why that example that I gave, sir was so confident and say, Lama, back pain, if she's got back pain, do it, she will be all right. 
So this whole thing of observing of, of, of just not the body, but the breath also, that is, that, that is so important. I think we somehow, we, we, we only take it as, as pranayama, but then this whole thing of doing your asana practice, uh, you know, the, the, the craft that you always showed us was like this. You go to a prime posture, then you use a counter pose to come out of the prime posture and this whole practice of the asana is to be able to sit in your pranayama, whatever you're going to be doing. That is that is what it is, and then it, it changes you like you know some you know who you are also that that there's a certain quietness as all of that happens. So I don't think you should just concentrate so much on just the body, body alone. Body alone is what is the body when when we separate the body and the breath, as simple as that, movement and breath. Then I don't think there's there is separation there. It goes together, and I remember you know he says that this is the breath, this is the movement. That was one of the main one of the few things that you tell when you begin a class. You know, this is your breath and this is the movement fits into the breath. And how is the movement? Is movement is through the body and the breath, of course. But then when you, you cannot isolate either, either or. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll try and uh, answer that as well. Um, yes, I mean, of course, uh, you know, um, when we studied um, at the Mandir in the 80s, there was hardly any emphasis on, on anatomy. I mean, once in a while there'd be something, but I don't remember being anatomy being like the the subject, so to speak. Um, and uh, this obsession, you see, these are obsessions. Um, the obsession with form, the obsession with precision, the obsession with anatomy um, are uh, are impositions on the body. Are, these are actually burden. They burden the body. And uh, yoga is not about burdening the body at all. In fact, it is about going to the place of sukh, which is like a sense of spaciousness. Um, so to answer this question as to what is it that... Also, I think this, uh, you know, yoga is a very, very intelligent practice. Uh, but let us kind of make it slightly removed from this idea of rationality because rationality actually might not be the most intelligent thing because there's something more than rationality. There's an intelligence, like if there is body, mind, breath, and something more, that something more also influences everything, everything that is countable and material and that can be analyzed. And uh, it is the something more that kind of, that excess, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, which, which colors the whole picture, so to speak. It changes the whole shade, so to speak. And uh, that cannot be rationally captured. That cannot be rationally analyzed. It can only be, it can only be um, uh, invited or uh, harbored or uh, visualized. So it remains, actually it remains within the, within the realm of a dharana. Mm. And dharana is not rational. Dharna is intelligent. Dharna is 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 uh, uh, like like an artist. Like if I'm if I if I'm, if I'm an artist and I'm making making something, or if uh, the Lita is making a sculpture, it goes beyond the rational, and that is my prerogative. As a as an artist, my prerogative and my duty is to go beyond the beyond the rational into the abstract. Similarly, dance and yoga are my duties to go beyond the rational. My, my prerogative and not just duty it's it's being it's being handed over to me it's cust like on a, on a tray to go beyond the rational to go beyond the into the abstract to go into the um, into the world of uh, dharana for lack of a better word because visualization is not quite dharana but that's the only word that we can think of it because and dharana is uh, there is freedom there's beauty of imagination in it there is that unfixedness of imagination in it, of it uh, it can go beyond my bones, beyond my joints, beyond my ligaments, beyond my muscles, beyond my skin, into that something else. And it involves all those. To have knowledge of my, of my bones, very important. But it is a secondary, it's an incidental knowledge. You know, to make these knowledges incidental. But if we make them precious, like, no, anatomy is like, you know, I have got like A plus in anatomy. And in, as though you need an A plus in anatomy to become a yoga teacher. No. I have no idea about anatomy. And I'm a decent yoga teacher. <laughs> and I'm a happy yoga teacher. <laughs> but I know, I know because it's a sensitivity. It's like, it's intuiting. 
Um, so these are obsessions. And I'm sorry, yoga is becoming obsessive. And these are all form obsessions, correctness obsessions, traditional obsessions, preciousness obsessions. And they are branding obsessions also. Totally not. branding. Something that is against the, the definition of our school. So that's my, so don't buy, I, I would, if they are young teachers, I would say, please, before you buy into anything, even this idea of anatomy, think many a times. Anytime you catch yourself buying into something, you are at a slippery slope. And if you, if you think that you bought into something very nice and very proper, sorry, you've made that wrong turn. Because there's nothing precious about this, nothing. Everything is fluid, open, beautiful. Except Deshikachar Yoga. You have to buy into Deshikachar Yoga. One and only. Literally. I... Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Navtej. Actually, that was the second next question from the audience. What would be, uh, for the second generation of teachers, what is it that we could do to uh, be true to the teachings of Sir? So, that's a question from Anupa. Oh. Mary Anubha. Okay. Um, I would say, you know, like I'm, I'm, I, 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 um, I can speak both as a dancer and as a yoga practitioner. And um, I realize that today, uh, you know, I mean, today the whole climate of the country is different. Like where tradition is being touted as something very precious and something that has to be preserved and something. Um, and I'm finding that every generation, every subsequent generation is becoming so and so to speak, more regressive. That's the only word I can think of in terms of, in terms of uh, upholding tradition and upholding values and making things precious and making, you know, and making th things self-righteous and making things chauvinist. I mean, there's chauvinism about tradition, which is literally choking the throat of art and beauty um, in this country today. So if you are young, you are, um, uh, you are uh, susceptible to the, the surround sound today is not friendly. It's not friendly to the body. It's not friendly, friendly to intuition. It's not friendly to, um, to ordinariness, which is the hallmark of this, of this style. So yes, Sir was a very special person. But servers like you and me. So don't put my desikachar on a pulpit. My desikachar is as immediate as your closest friend is. So to, to go into the state of reverence, you know, uh, or to go into the state of preciousness, be, beware of anything being defined as precious. Because that is that is, to my mind, that is poison to practice. Preciousness is because it makes you self-conscious and it makes you self-consciously very, not self-aware, but self-conscious. Like if you self-consciously preserve this, you know, I'm karna hai. Huh? And the minute the body goes into that self-conscious tension, it's a tension in the body. That tension is invasive. It's foreign to the body. It's foreign to the practice. It's foreign to sukha, which the practice is promising you. So please don't buy, don't make anything precious and don't buy into anything precious because anything that's precious is quite often bogus. I'm the, ten, the, the, the thing behind preciousness is bogus. So beware. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Lalita, would you like to... I think I think you have to be completely honest about yourself about why you want to do what you want to do. It's like you know when even when you the thing is uh, this whole thing of I am this, I am that, I am this, I am going to do this, I am going to fix your body. Okay, when they come for for therapy or something, it is not about that. It's that it's just that for me, if I'm able to help somebody you know, from pain to a better, better place, that's enough for me. I'm not, I'm not here to say I will, I, you know, 
yes, we have, we have all the tools, so the starters, everything. But then this whole thing of this, this ego that comes into the picture and saying, I am this. And I, he never ever, like I said earlier, we never went there to become teachers. We just happened to become teachers. We just, I mean, he gave, he just gave everything to us. He just gave it to us without holding back anything. And I think that's what we all so respect for what he gave us. So this whole idea of, you know, uh, 200 hours, somebody the other day, uh, uh, you know, sent me a message saying, I want to be a, a, a yoga teacher. This, this some, some, such and such a place is offering a 200 hour uh, session, you know, a, a, a course. And then at the end of it, you'll become, there'll be a certification. If you do like that, I, I can positively say that you will be in trouble. If you don't understand your own body, if you don't understand your own thing, how are you going to understand somebody else? This whole idea is, when you keep saying, I want to be something, then I think you're, you're you know, going on dangerous grounds. So you have to, you have to trust, trust where, who you go to to learn and who, uh, you know, it's over a period of time. It's not like a three month course in 200 hours. It's not that. You cannot, because it's, it's all, it's like, you know, what, what Navtej, I completely agree with what Navtej just said. That is that today is the day, and uh, you know it's it's different. To, that uh, the times that we are living in is different. When you associate uh, time and space with money, uh, that's that's another very dangerous thing that you're walking on. First of all, you should be able to understand what you are doing, why you're doing everything, even even in sculpture. Also, when we when we choose a material that we work on in a particular piece. You have to be very conscious about, I, at least I am. I know that, that that particular material also has to speak to you. Absolutely. It has to speak to you. You cannot just, but you know, the whole world is doing something and therefore I'll take that material and I'll do it in my work. It'll, it will not work. It'll, it'll fall so flat. You have to, the choice of material is also so important in your work. And that's the way I relate to, you know, I think all of those things have come in from source teaching into my own work that you have to be so honest with what you do, so honest with what you do, then it'll definitely, you know, you know that's, that's, that's the way I look at it. Lalita, I'm going to and I want just find up page, no? I have a question. Now, can I just add one thing to what yeah, Lalita sure. said and then you have it, sorry. Yeah, right. yeah. So the whole thing that Lalita said about, you know, that ego of that INS, that I will do this, that same thing also extends as far as I'm concerned to to tradition or to the style that you think that you think that you are upholding the right tradition, that self-consciousness itself is also um, detrimental for lack of, I mean, that, and that's detrimental is like a very tame word um, because it's violent. So this self-consciousness that I will fix it or I am like, it's the same, it's an extension of the ego, but gone into, into little more than just yourself, but your tradition, your school, whatever. So if I am, if I love my school, I'm not saying, I'm not, I mean, I, I, I want to make a distinction between that. And I'm not being chauvinistic about the KYM, but I adore it. I respect it. I love it. And I'm so grateful to be part of it. But I'm not saying, I'm not doubting it. I'm the, I'm the, I'm not the, I'm still, I'm not the custodian of the KYM. Why? Because what I teach is not the KYM. It is inspired by the KYM, but it's become something else, which sir has allowed me to make. I'm, 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 I'm doing, perhaps I'm doing things which the KYM doesn't do, but they're all inspired by the KYM and allowed by the KYM. So, uh, so to be, to be, to be, um, um, uh, to be grateful, to be appreciating something and to become the custodian of that are two different things. So let's not become custodians of Sir's teachings. Sir's teachings are beyond, like yoga is beyond us. You and I put together cannot save yoga or preserve yoga. And that's not our job. But it's let it flow. Yeah. Sorry, Raghu, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to twist both your tails a little bit, if I'm allowed to. Mm -hmm. A young teacher, Navtej, has a double bind, no? See, if I don't have this uh, certification, how do I start teaching and so on? And yet, I completely agree with you. If I get caught to that certification, it's like a rope around my neck no? so how how does a young teacher then navigate it 
see because you um, guys are you guys are poncha who are teachers you've seen all this and you come to the stage now when you can you know talk about understanding the material when i start i imitate no i see kcs panikar doing something i want to do the same thing I, right that's how a young teacher starts yeah any no but person, but uh, any, any medium they start like this no so how will you no. No, from, you know, I, I think it applies whether, whether it's a sculpture or art or anything. There is a foundation that you, you do have, you work within the parameters of, of the language, of the grammar, of everything. And then after that, unless you understand that, I cannot, I cannot go into abstraction from day one and I say, I want to do like Panikar's work or anybody else's work. Not possible. Unless you understand how my, the structure of my face or the structure of the whole body is, and the lines that are there, I will not, and it's not that we learn anatomy. We, it, it is purely on, on, on your power of observation. So yes, I understand this, this whole thing of this, this thing of, of having a certification and not having a certification, or you know, doing a diploma course or doing a master's program in sculpture, all of that. It is just that you have to give yourself that time. Yes, if you want to teach, you have to allow for yourself to say, yes, I do. Do I understand what I'm teaching? And if like, you know, this person said 200 hours, then when I talk to Sarah, she says, it's a two-year program. Where is 200 hours? Where is a two-year program? So if you, if you want like instant gratification, not possible. This is what, when you say, when you talk about, you know, being, doing, doing abstract works, I want to do abstract works. You will not do abstract. You cannot do abstract works if you do not understand the line. If I see a buffalo on the road and I say, uh, I make a very, very realistic uh, rendition of the buffalo. And then when I keep doing that rendition, uh, of, of a realistic rendition about a million times, then I will know which lines to cut off to say, it still looks at the same buffalo. So I think it's, it's a question of being uh, how long you take and how long is this? This is not an instant uh, anywhere. It is not, it, it, it is your playing around with other people's lives. You should also understand that. Yeah. And by the way, Lalita, there used to be a beautiful abstract buffalo on KCS Panikas table. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of Picasso also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this thing, it's, it's a very tricky question, uh, Raghu, about um, you know, diplomas and teachers, because uh, uh, it's a chicken and egg kind of a question um, as to, but I think, like I, I do date as Studio Bihas, we haven't started, like I keep this, I keep planning on starting a teacher's training program, but I still have not. Like it's always on the anvil. For the last 10 years, there's a teacher's training program on the anvil, but I haven't been able to bring myself to start it because I, disagree with it actually. But on the other hand, what I've done is that people, some students who have come um, and when I feel that they are ready, I just, I just give them a certificate saying you're a teacher. Without them knowing, I'm thinking of that. And uh, so I've done that with like three, four people who I feel are teachers and they would, a certificate would help them. And uh, so I just kind of slip it in, in, you know, into the pocket, so to speak, you know. uh, because the most important thing is that you need to be in love with what you're doing. And you can't, you can't say, oh, I'm going to become yoga. I'll do yoga and then fall in love with it. I don't think that's how it goes. You're just going to, you're just going to slip into yoga and you, before you know, you are like completely imbued and then there's no going back. We all know that, that we became teachers inadvertently because we didn't plan on becoming teachers, but then there was no going back. Absolutely. And uh, so that when you come to the point of no return, <coughs> you can be granted a certificate. That's when you've, 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 you've gained a certificate. But if you already have like a, a, a certificate in mind, um, you will not actually, I think it's difficult to even, even slip into the process then. So this is, um, this is what I think. And I still am struggling with it, by the way. I mean, I'm still, by the way, there's still on our, on our agenda is to start a teacher's training program by the end of this year. So um, I'm still kind of refining the thing, but I haven't done it so far. 
No, I like this. Say. I like this thing of slipping the certificate into the pocket. <laughs> I also think that's how we all. I mean, we also kind of you know we didn't get a certificate, but we were we were said like now pat on the back now go and teach. So. Yeah, Navtej, after 12, 13 years of doing training programs, I've actually, like a full circle now, I've decided to do what you were saying. Hmm. Teach, learn, and when you're ready, maybe. When you're ready, yeah. Thank you. If you're ready, you won't ask for a certificate, and that's the time we'll give you one. Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. When it becomes redundant, literally, <laughs> you 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 gain a certificate when the certificate becomes redundant, redundant for you. Yeah. But if you're looking for a certificate, you're not qualified yet. Thank so you. That's a paradox. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm just doing a time check here. Uh, just one minute, Hari. Oh, oh, sorry. We have one minute, uh, Hari. Uh, Navdej, the, the 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 irony is, Prabhakar and I sat and worked out the framework for the first certification program oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and has got the copy of what was typed out and Deshkachar is signed on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So one is from Adzri Adzri Adzri. Yeah, yeah. If there's time. Yeah. So this is uh, regarding uh, teaching. So her question is Deshikachar's style of teaching to an individual makes so much sense and yet we are asked to teach large groups of students. How do we keep an eye on the individual and the group at the same time? Very simple. I will not teach groups. I absolutely. <laughs> See, no, I'm, I, I teach groups. Very simple. I, I will not teach a group. I teach groups and it's a, it's a question I can't answer. Um, because um, uh, you know, it's, an, it's a hit or miss thing. Um, very often, I don't know, you, you enter the room and you, you get a pulse of the room. And um, so, I mean, I, I only teach groups because I don't have the time to teach individuals because I do other things as well apart from yoga. And uh, once in a while, I feel bad for some people. I think some people are getting hurt uh, because um, they, are, they have conditions. And I, I, you know, I try to place the onus on them and say, you know, you know what, what not to do. Um, and that's a practice in itself because people always get tempted to try out something, even which is not good for them. So, so they do end up, some of them do get up ending, uh, end up getting hurt. Um, so when I started, I must say, when I started many, many years ago, like 25, or, Jesus, I've forgotten my, my arithmetic now. I don't know when I started. But I, I started, I started, and I, I would call it the group, the trusted group of four. I would have four people in my class and four similar kind of bodies. And I would call them the trusted group of four. So they would, they would, there was trust within them. They knew each other. But at, it, that, that worked. That format worked. Because they were similar, like they were bad backs put together, bad bees put together, normal people put together, about, sorry, normal, not normal as in, without any uh, issues or uh, young people, older people. Um, but now that there are larger groups, I think more or less it works, but once in a while, Anupas nodding. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> so once in a while they get hurt. Um, and that's so that's something that I I, I I I still haven't been able to kind of grapple with, like find a solution to that. But by and large, I think, yeah. What's your experience, Sriram? I'm yeah, your it's, it's absolutely, it's a totally different type of teaching. I mean, there are certain technical details, like uh, when it comes to the even the breath or the way you uh, or posture, there are certain details which can be sort of uh, given out or even spoken of in classes, in groups. But uh, it's a personal attention which, which makes this really enter the body of the person, enter the mind of the person. It's that personal attention or the personal touch or the personal word which uh, brings that effect. Therefore, you know, it's absolutely, uh, what do you call it? There's no way of, uh, of uh, replacing individual attention. So I think this is something which is very essential to uh, Sir's teachings and I think we should uh, 
keep it up. And of course, like I also teach, like Nav Fitch does groups and um, it's inevitable in today's context, but uh, it's important to continue yeah. to lay stress on personal attention. I'd just like to add to that, um, Navtej and Sriram, because I also, I don't teach too much nowadays, but when I have taught in a group, like also for dance, you know, sometimes we're not only teaching an individual to dance, it's three or four of us in a class. I think the teacher requires to be that much more alive uh, in ourselves. If I'm not in good shape, I think teaching a group becomes very difficult because Inevitably, in a group, if, if you're doing an asana practice, there is somebody, something that will draw your attention. Somebody will draw your attention. And to be alive to that is very important. Because, or, you know, and then you go there and quietly you talk to them and get them out of that. Then something else draws your attention. But to be alive to an individual in a group, to me, is very important. Because sometimes we do teach groups and many people teach groups. So I wouldn't say that we need to withdraw from that entirely. But I would still respect an individual in a group. One, and I think it's very important to know the, like um, Navtej was saying, very important to know the composition of the group. Not just the physical composition, also the emotional composition of that. And if there is something that is not very uh, harmonious, just to be alive to it. So as a somebody who is um, coordinating that group or teaching that group, we're alive to the fact that there may be something that is different in each, each individual. Because group classes are a necessity sometimes and we can't go away. But to be able to respect an individual in a group to me would be the challenge of the teacher. Thank you, Chotsna. For... Riku, you are speaking. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add the few times when I've taught in a group now, my challenge has been not to get a little anxious and a little angry with people who are so insensitive to their bodies. You're saying, how can you do this? Yeah, can you not watch yourself? <laughs> Some things like that. <laughs> That's been true, my true, 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 absolutely. Sometimes. And I'm sure you'll all agree that teaching groups is the most exhausting thing on earth. I mean, I can do a full telana and I'll be fine, but I teach a group and I'm like exhausted. <laughs> So, um, <clears throat> our last question for this dialogue is uh, regarding dance and yoga. So perhaps even Josna can add on. It's to Namtej. I think partly you have answered this in your earlier sharing of discovering your own style, but I'll still read out. The question is from Manisha. The grammar in dance seems to be like classical asanas, a reference. But isn't dance also intimate in that we discover our own style, our own meaning, just like you seems to have done? How would you say you have blended yoga and dance in your apyasa? Uh, the answer is first of all, yes. Uh, dance is as, as adaptive, so to speak, as an asana is. And, um, and I think sensitive teachers uh, would, would allow you that or even encourage you that. Uh, I, I just give one example that when I, in, when I was in my first year and I had my uh, dance exam and for some reason, um, I was the only one to, to take the exam with, uh, with Atte, with Rukhne Devi. So, um, so she asked me to do the Adabus. And um, to my shock and horror, she says, now do the same Adabu, uh, which is a phrase of movement, but using this hand and bending the side. And I'm like, oh, but this is not what we've been taught. This is, this, is not the, this is not the form. And... Um, and of course I did it. And she says, very good. So she kind of literally made me, you know, do a tattay taha. So no, tattay taam. I said, first tattay taam she made me do. And she made me change the hastas. It was, I didn't do a katha mukha, I did something else. And uh, she made me bend differently. And this was happening in, like Josna said, this was happening in front of Shardha teacher. So I'm looking at Shardha teacher because she had taught me differently. And, uh, but she made me totally like, at the spur of the moment, change it. Um, and with Leela Akka, um, she would uh, make us do one body would do this and the other body would do that and she says, ah, this suits you better. So she would change the form to suit what suited me better and what, and she would decide as to what suited, her better, suited us better because she was the teacher. So this adaptability is there. Uh, this fluidity is there. Um, 
it's just a matter of um, it's just a matter of becoming open to that kind of pedagogy. But this is not, you see, it is this idea that the classical is fixed. But that first of all, what is the classical? You know, I mean, that's the whole big issue. That what is the classical? Um, I mean, is the classical a bogus definition? First of all, so within the classical, um, is classical fixed, or is classical fluid? Um, and if you buy into the idea of that classical is fluid, and that my body is not the same as somebody else's body, and I shall, and my body is not going to be the same tomorrow, so I will adapt, and I have the permission to adapt, and I have the ease to adapt, and I have the facility to adapt. So that's all I can say. That this, like, we literally not buy into the idea that these things are fixed, because they are not. Freedom is very, very integral to practice. You know this thing of adhikar. It's my, I'm like, it's my body, it's my practice, it's my rules. At the end of the day, this is what matters. And I'm not being disrespectful. I'm doing this very, very respectfully. Thank you, Navtej. Jyotsna, would you like to add anything? No, it's been wonderful to listen to Navtej articulate this. So I would leave it with his articulation. It's very, very beautiful to listen to Thank you. Thank you, Navdeep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Just to tell you that Jyotsna's mother is my teacher, Ambiyaka, and she's looking so much like Ambiyaka now. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Sriram, did you have a question? Uh, I thought you shared earlier. You're on mute. We can't hear you. Oh, okay, yeah, well, fine. Actually, on several occasions, I've heard, uh, I've got the feeling in my interactions with Sir that he has a special soft corner for artists, yeah. And for very imaginable reasons, I don't want to go into it. But uh, uh, both of you have a question, maybe a word or a sentence or even a thought. What has art given your you the practice? In what way has you being an artist influenced your understanding of practice yoga? Maybe. At least, I think it will be a good inspiration for many of us to hear that. Yeah. I'll go. Shall I? Yeah, please. I think, uh, I think as an artist, um, um, the artist in me is a daydreamer. And I bring that daydreaming to my yoga practice. It's simple as that. What? Yeah, I'll just, uh, this was, uh, you know, when uh, Sir had asked me to do a portrait of Periwar, and he gave me the small room in the mandiram in the back. And when you are, when you are actually doing it, I don't think this whole thing of, you know, that quietness that comes in, you don't even realize that quietness and that concentration with what you are there, you are there and you are there with your, uh, you know, portrait stand and the clay in front of you, and nothing else matters. So I think that 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 full zoning into what you are doing, whether how you are doing it or what you are doing, is there. And then the the sir has sometimes just walked in very quietly, and I've not even noticed him. And then suddenly you get a thing, you get a thing, and say, "Oh my God, he's standing there." But then he just just as quietly as he came, he would quietly go out, go back. But this whole thing of how that whole concentration that you're, you're doing there and you're just there, but just with that, I think uh, when, you're, when you're doing your asana practice or anything, you're there, you're there. I mean, maybe you initially when you're doing it or even now for, for that matter, you don't know that you're doing it with that much of concentration because there's so many other things happening around you. But then that, that, that few little seconds that you feel that is just, it's so supreme it is. You know, it's not often that you feel one with what you're yeah. doing, but at times when you feel that it is, it is so beautiful. It is so beautiful. And only when you come out of it, do you say, oh my God, I was in there. I wish I could be there for a longer time. I also missed Navtej's response to this. So if you wouldn't mind, please, would you repeat oh, yourself? Okay, sure, sure. 
Thank um, you. I, I, I said I had said that uh, the artist in me is um, is a daydreamer, and I bring that daydreaming into my into my yoga practice. And and the thing is, you know, I've been I've been talking about, about, about uh, autonomy or adhikar or something, uh, because in a, in a daydream there are two things happening. A, I am doing something which will satisfy me just so, because I'm dreaming to this satisfaction, you know, that just and it's just right. And on the other hand, and I'm doing it with a sense of freedom. So there's freedom and I'm the, the, the aim is to satisfy myself. And it's not a gratification of sorts. It is like coming, like to, to experience that rasa, so to speak, that, that sensory uh, experience of the body, which is, which is ras. So it is, um, so that's what, uh, to me, yoga is full of rasa. And rasa comes from daydreaming and with that autonomy. <laughs> and it's very interesting when you're putting in message. Thank you. Uh, this is Desika Char. I, mean, I remember Desika Char says, I just have to tell you that when I would go, go into the season and perform, and by, by the time the reviews came, I would be back in Delhi. So I get these big envelopes, you know, with, with all the things. Thank you. Oh, congratulations. Good. Well done. All my reviews from the Hindu and from Madras would come to me a week later, signed by Desika Char. So he'd clip them, he'd cut them and send them to me. What a man. Okay. Thank you all. It's been really a pleasure. Yeah, it's absolutely. Such a, so hard Thank thing you so much. To, to hear everybody, I mean, hear Lalita and the questions and to, to be able to speak. I haven't spoken about Sir in, you know, forever, so to speak. And it's so... It was so nice to be able to remember him and thank you. Thank, thank you. you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, all organizers as well as Lalita and Thanks a lot. So thank you all. Uh, thank you, especially Navtej and Lalita for joining us today. And uh, Raku, Jyotsna, Sri Ram Saras. Um, for supporting this initiative and leading it. And thank you everyone who could make time to join us today. Such a rich, evocative and beautiful dialogue. And, and I'm also sitting this feeling that for younger teachers like us, I think the series is turning out to be such an invaluable sharing from all the students to get a perspective of how uh, you guys learned. So thank you so much. Thank you, Hari. Thank, thank you, Purva. Thank you, Saras. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, TV. Thank you, Saras. Bye, guys. Thank you, TV, Jyotsna, Sriram, Balita. Bye. Bye, Nathesh. Bye. 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 Bye.